I've told this story, uh, I don't know how many times I've told this story in a sermon, and I don't know if anybody remembers it. So I, I want you to know that I remember telling this story in sermons before. It's an important story and it goes so well with this scripture that I want to tell it again. With maybe a different slant this time. Uh, when I was in the Philippines, I worked with five different tribes in northeastern Mindanao Island in the southern Philippines. And one of the tribes uh, was called the Mamanwa tribe. So the Mamanwa tribe were hunter-gatherers. They lived entirely from, from the forest in, uh, in, their, in, in their ancestral land where they, where they lived, their, their home, homeland. They, were, they hunted and they fished and they gathered from, from that area where they, where they, where they were. And they, they, they thought of, they, they kind of had a way of thinking about the land that might best be described as a kind of umbilical cord. They would use this kind of language, that the earth is an umbilical cord which binds us to our creator. There's this, this profound sense of dependency on God for everything that they, that they had. Um, their shelter, their, their clothing, everything was derived almost directly from the created world, nuts, that they might gather, or berries, root crops that they could find, clo making clothes from, from, uh, from the forest. I have here a little show and tell. This is a cloth made by another tribal group that, that's made from uh, abaca, um, gathered from the forest. And they would, this, this, this would be a fabric that they would take and make and weave directly from, from the forest. Um, bound with their creator. They certainly sensed that the world was charged with the grandeur of God. Over the years of the 20th century, uh, if we're borrowing language from the Gerard Manley Hopkins poem, the earth became seared, smeared and bleared with industrial civilization. Uh, generations have trod, have trod, have trod, and the forest was destroyed, cut down by logging and mining practices, silted the rivers and the lakes and the bays. And the Mamanwa were no longer able to live off of the land. Their practices of hunter-gathering uh, hunter um, were gone. It was as, as if the umbilical cord was cut. And they were struggling to survive. I mean, their, very, their very survival became a, a question. Would these people be able to make it? Many of them made their ways to cities where they were, were doing the urban kind of counterpart to hunting and gathering, which was begging and scavenging. Begging and scavenging in the cities, living homeless on the streets. It was a, a very sad sight. You, could, you, could, you, you recognized, oh, they're Mamanwa, there they are. They're wandering the streets begging and scavenging because their way of life was being literally destroyed by industrial civilization. I worked uh, with a, an MCC partner, Mennonite Central Committee partner, that was trying to help the tribal groups in uh, northeastern Mindanao in a variety of ways. And one of the things that my Filipino colleagues were doing, I wasn't any good at this, but my colleagues were good at it, is they were trying to help the Mamanwa farm and, and, learn, to, and learn to get food from farming. And since hunting and gathering was not an option, maybe, they could, maybe we could teach them to farm and they would be able to, to harvest uh, the earth and to grow crops and to eat from what they had, what they had made and produced. And every, every three months we would have these meetings where we would evaluate our work. And in one of these meetings, uh, it was noted that, that the Mamanwa community in Mainit had a bountiful harvest. It was a, it was a great triumph. We were so happy that, they, that our Filipino colleagues working in the agricultural section had taught them to farm. 
and they, and, and, and they had all this food and produce and they weren't, and they weren't hungry anymore. We, were, we felt so good about that. Well, three months later, the next quarter, we had another time of evaluating our work and we learned that the Maman were, in Maine, were hungry. They had no food. It's like, well, what happened to all the food that they had in that harvest that was, that was going to that they were gonna, that was gonna be laid out for them. Um, they were supposed to sow and reap and gather into barns. What happened? Well, the Mamanwa uh, had given all that food away to their friends and their relatives and cousins who were hungry. They could not imagine this concept of storing, of building bigger barns, if you will, and, and creating a kind of uh, a, 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 a capital accumulation, sort of storing their grain and drawing on it over time. This was not, saving was not a concept that, that they, could, they could imagine. They were dependent day to day on the existence of God to provide for them. This, this story is an important story in, in my life because it lights up the scripture for me. It just lights it up. Uh, because we see this kind of hunter-gatherer mentality all over the scriptures, right? Don't we? I mean, I, I do. I start, I, my reaction when I heard this was, oh my. Here are these people who are living the Jesus life who hadn't even heard of Jesus. I thought, oh. That, that kind of means the, the, the Bible is a, is a hunter-gatherer mentality. And the, the passage that was read this morning is a hunter-gatherer mentality. J- Jesus lived like a hunter-gatherer, day to day. Um, birds have nests, foxes have holes, except for maybe the one that was in the memorial garden last week. Uh, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Jesus lived like the Mamanwa. And, and, and the Israelites in the wilderness, given manna from heaven, dependent on God every day and forbidden to store any of it for one day except for the Sabbath, which was to be a day of rest. And when they tried to gather more and store it, it got wormy, it rotted, it was inedible. They were, were compelled to live day by day dependent on the reality of God and God's provision. This is the mentality, this is the mind of Scripture at its deepest and most profound. So what's happened to us? What's happened to us that, that, that we don't think that way? What's happened to us that, that I and my Filipino colleagues think that we can go to the Maman one we can, and we can have them learn to farm and learn to store? Why do, we, why do we think that? What is that mentality? Why is it that we think that we are the ones who provide for ourselves? How does this mentality come? To us, that we care for ourselves, that we are responsible for ourselves. We provide for ourselves. We, where does this come from? Where does this idea come from that we, that, we, that we have? We have these scriptures. Do we not believe them? Why is this so hard for us? Well, one of the things as I think about that, that's hard is technology. Technology. So my... Uh, my, the sermon title, which didn't make, which one of the glitches was, uh, the sermon title did not make the print bulletin. The sermon title that was to be in the bulletin was God the Builder. God the Builder. It's a cultural reference. Who gets it? Not many people get it. Okay, you have to have children of a certain age or be, have been a child of a certain age. It, it refers to Bob the Builder, the children's. I mean, Bob the Builder, can we fix it, Bob the Builder? Yes, we can. It's very catchy. Um, Bob, but the scripture tells us 
in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 4, that God is the builder of everything that is. That's a very strange, uh, very strange thing, thing for us in our technologically advanced society where we are convinced that we have built all these things. We have built these, these buildings, these incredible buildings, these skyscrapers, these complex, um, complex machines that transport us here and there and do all these kinds of things. I have in my pocket a, um, a mini computer called an iPhone. Um, my alternate title was My iPhone is Charged with the Grandeur of God. <laughs> um, it's not charged with this little cord here. It's charged with the grandeur of God. And we don't think that way. It's funny, right? I mean, it's funny to say this, my iPhone is charged with the grandeur of God because we think that, the, that Steve Jobs built the iPhone, right? Or Apple Corporation built the iPhone, or maybe a factory in China, a Foxconn factory in China built the iPhone. To say that God built the iPhone is an odd thing to, to think or to say. But I'm going to, I'm going to claim this morning that God built the iPhone. The, the way that I, the, the, my basis for saying that, I have trouble believing it myself, mind you, but I'm gonna say it anyway, is that we, if I think about us as human beings, ourselves, just differently. If we think about, think of ourselves as separate from God, right? A cut umbilical cord, if you will, we can begin to think of ourselves as doing things apart from God. The fact is we can do nothing apart from God. Our very existence as beings is dependent on the reality of God. Any ability that we have to create any kind of technology, no matter how simple, whether it's the most simple plow or the most complex computer gadget, we depend on God for everything. And we have created administrative tools, right? Insurance uh, companies and financial, a global financial system, which is, a, which is technology, essentially. It's a tool of control. And it creates in us the illusion that we are in charge, that we have built it, that it is out of our own ingenuity, our own cleverness, that we have conjured up all these wonders. And we are, we are wrong in believing that. Now it's true, we can take what we've created, what we've built, and turn it towards evil purposes, right? But the fact of the matter is, even in our brokenness, everything we do is dependent, we are dependent on God for all things. Crucial, a crucial point. And all the things that we have built and all the things that we have done to creation, all of our trotting, cannot alienate what is from God. That's the other truth of the scripture, right? It cannot be alienated. The, the land we learned two weeks ago with Nabo's Vineyard cannot be alienated from God. It will not be. Money. Last week, Ananias and Sapphira cannot be alienated from God, will not be. And our technological creations cannot be alienated from God, will not be alienated from God. The wonderful text that we, we, we love about swords being turned into plowshares is precisely that point. We can build all the missiles that we want, all the warheads that we want, all the guns that we want, but nothing will change the fact 
that these will not be alienated from God. Swords will be turned into plowshares. That, that's worthy of an amen, I think. Um, that is the truth that God has built everything that is. We have in this sense of, our, of, of ourselves and of the control that we have uh, managed with our technology, this, this illusion that we, we are in charge. And there's a kind of arrogance in our civilization. We are an arrogant civilization. We have this belief that we are not dependent on God and through our own ingenuity and, and our own creativity that belongs to us, either as individuals or as a species, we can solve all these problems. We can do all these things. And we are deluding ourselves. We are dependent on God. And the culmination of human life, the culmination of all life, is not in our achievements as a species and as a civilization. The culmination of all life is in the one true, living, and eternal God. We sang these, these wonderful words this morning from This is God's Wondrous World. Oh, let me ne'er forget that though the wrong seems off so strong, God is the ruler yet. This is God's wondrous world. The battle is not done. Jesus, who died, shall be glorified, and earth and heaven shall be one. That is the culmination of our lives, of our being, of our existence. One of the things that, I've, that has dawned on me as I thought about the story of the Mamanwan and read this passage is that I, that I have had a tendency to call this a hunter-gatherer ethic, the Mamanwa way of living, a hunter-gatherer ethic. And I think that's true. I, but I think there's another layer here. More than being a hunter-gatherer ethic, what's present in the Mamanwa way of living and what's present in the scriptures is a hunter-gatherer spirituality. It's not so much a way of, of doing, but it's a way of being. It's a way of thinking about God in particular and of thinking about ourselves in relation to God. I think that's important, and I think that's an important distinction. We were, one of the wonderful things about traveling to a conference is, is visiting with people along the way, and in our conversation yesterday, uh, uh, or the, uh, two days ago, on our way down, um, somebody mentioned uh, addictions, that we are an addictive civilization. Hmm, we are an addictive civilization. And that, like, that, that resonated with me. Like, I thought about that before, but we are addicted. We are addicted to many things, but primarily we're addicted to our own control and our own power. And when you work with addictions, and, and most of us struggle with some addiction or another, when you work with addictions, the tendency is to moralize. Well, that's wrong. What's wrong with them? Don't they have any self-discipline? Like that tends to be how we respond. That's sort of a, a visceral reaction. We want, a, we want an, an ethic. It's wrong to do that. It's morally wrong. But those who work with addictions will say that there's something much deeper going on. It's not an ethical crisis for that person. It's not an ethical crisis for our civilization. It is a spiritual crisis. The very ideas we have about who we are as people in relation to God are warped. And the only answer is spiritual transformation, a spiritual change in how we think about ourselves in relationship to God, how we are our being in relationship to God. 
How do we, so it raises the question, how do we do that? So I think the role of the churches and all communities of faith is crucial at this point in, in the human story. It's crucial. If this is a spiritual crisis, then a community of faith and communities of faith are crucial. I have a new, maybe kind of focus, kind of personal focus statement as I think about what it means to be church. The world does not need another program, another project, or another initiative to do stuff from the church, from churches. And I mean the church, capital C church. What the world needs is the sacred. The world needs to become more alive to God. And that's our calling. That is our vocation as God's people. So what does that mean for us? I've been thinking this week about the mendicant orders of the Middle Ages, like the Franciscans. Mendicant means that they were, they were beggars. They, they tried to live a hunter-gatherer spirituality in the midst of ordinary lives. And they were not allowed to ask to, they were not allowed to, to make their own food. They had to beg. They had to beg day to day and rely on, be dependent on others for their survival. Like hunter-gatherers. Where's my meal going to come from today? I don't know, but God will provide. And you go out and you beg. That is, a, that is a, for in our society where we are so convinced that we are, need to be responsible and in charge and provide for ourselves, what is a strange way of thinking? Now, I want to be clear. I'm not suggesting that you start doing this. And if I see you on the um, street corner begging and saying, oh, I'm going to take that quite seriously and I'm going to live that way, I, I'm not sure that's, that's what we should be doing. But I say that to say that there are spiritual practices uh, that, that in our tradition that, that are recognized that this is important. And I think the first thing that I, I, I recommend doing is to pray every day, confessionally, our impotence and our radical dependence on God. And I don't know how, what prayer is. And prayer means different things to different people. But ultimately, it's prayer. Ultimately, being a people of prayer uh, is crucial to the survival, to our survival as a species. If we cannot pray, and if we cannot become a people of prayer, there's no, there's no hope for us. There's no future for us. If we cannot say to God, God, we are dependent on you for everything that we have. We are dependent on you for our very lives, for our very being, for our very existence. All we have belongs to you. If we could pray that in some way every day, and the Psalms are filled with this. I encourage you to pray the Psalms. The Psalms are filled with this kind of language, this sense of radical dependence on God. Become a people of prayer. Amen.